Well, good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good morning to all our online viewers, wherever you may be. My name is Russell Xiao. I am the executive director here at the Global Taiwan Institute. GTI is a 501c3 think tank dedicated exclusively to Taiwan policy research and related programs. Our mission is to enhance the relationship between the United States and Taiwan and Taiwan with the world by contributing to a more informed discussion about Taiwan and its people. In pursuit of that mission, we undertake several major programs. They include a bi-weekly publication called the Global Taiwan Brief, where we feature timely analysis written by in-house experts, as well as external contributors about current policy developments related to Taiwan. We also uh, organize regular seminars in the form of webinars these days, uh, where we have current discussions with leading thinkers and, and uh, about Taiwan policy and issues related to Taiwan. We organize a, an or, annual symposium in the fall uh, where we invite policymakers as well as academics to engage in a comprehensive discussion about the past, present, and future of U.S.-Taiwan relations. In addition to these uh, programs, we also offer scholarships uh, for American researchers interested in conducting short-term field research in Taiwan, and also for Taiwanese researchers who are interested to conduct short-term field research here in our office in Washington, D.C. We also organize um, cultural programs, um, which mainly include um, movie screenings uh, of Taiwanese films. Now, if you're not already subscribed to receive uh, all our updates, you may do so uh, by visiting our website at www.globaltaiwan.org, uh, where you'll also be able to find information on how you may be able to contribute to our programs, either by writing for our publications um, or uh, in, in other uh, opportunities that we may offer uh, at the Institute. Now, I would be remiss, of course, if I uh, started today's program without thanking our co-founders, our board of directors, as well as staff and interns who make all our programs uh, possible. So let's start today's program. Most Taiwan and cross-strait observers can agree that the past four years have been nothing short of momentous for U.S.-Taiwan relations. The United States has taken many steps to bolster Washington's relationship with Taipei based on the Taiwan Relations Act, the Six Assurances, and the three communiques. This is in part because of growing U.S.-China tensions, mounting instability in the Taiwan Strait as, as Beijing ratchets up its political, economic, and military pressure campaign against Taiwan, all in an attempt to coerce the Taiwanese government into accepting its terms for cross-strait negotiations. However, it is also part of a growing recognition of the intrinsic and strategic value of Taiwan's democracy in this new geopolitical environment. Measures by the United States justified in support of maintaining the cross-strait status quo have included high-level business by cabinet officials, the regularization and approval of a record number of arms sales to Taiwan in 2020, more public naval transit through the Taiwan Strait, and other forms of visible support for Taiwan's international space most recently demonstrated by the former Secretary of State's announcement of the lifting of self-imposed restrictions uh, on contact guidelines with Taiwanese officials. And we'll get into that, I'm sure, later in the discussion. Among other measures, there's also been an unprecedented debate in the U.S. policy community about the need to shift to a position of strategic clarity in terms of coming to Taiwan's defense in the event of a Chinese invasion of the island. All of these developments are also occurring against the backdrop of a remarkable souring of public sentiments in the United States, Taiwan, and throughout the world towards Beijing, especially since the outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, that originated in Wuhan, China, and as a result of Beijing's ongoing suppression of Hong Kong's uh, democracy, manifested by the extradition law and the ramming through of the national security law that has made the U.S. to determine that Hong Kong no longer possess a high degree of autonomy. Of course, these events have had global impact and has also had a significant impact on political dynamics in Taiwan and the trajectory of cross-strait relations. 
<clears throat> At the very least, the unrest in Hong Kong starting in 2019 provided a stark visual image for the people of Taiwan to envision what a, a future closer with the People's Republic of China and under CCP interference could look like, underscoring what has already been a major concern within the Taiwanese population over Chinese interference in its democracy. This has arguably led in part to the turn of fortune that facilitated this strong support in the re-election of President Tsai Ing-wen as president uh, and also the ruling uh, party, Democratic Progressive Parties um, in the January 2020 elections. With a renewed and strong mandate in hand, the Thai government has beefed up the country's defense expenditures, pushed through the lifting of restriction of import on U.S. pork and beef, which have long impeded further developments in U.S.-Taiwan trade relations, and perhaps most importantly, demonstrated an exemplary handling of the COVID-19 outbreak that rightfully earned it the praise of the international community, especially the United States, which has touted the the Taiwan model. Now in November, uh, Joseph Biden was elected as the 46th president of the United States. Tensions in the Taiwan Strait continue to grow, and there are no indications that Beijing will relent on its pressure campaign against Taiwan. National security officials and experts now worry openly about the possibility of a military conflict, limited or otherwise. With 2021 being the centenary of the founding of the Chinese uh, Communist Party, some have even suggested that this year would be when China could make its move against Taiwan. But as noted earlier, any actual moves provoking a military conflict will be contending with a strong headwind in the form of strong U.S. support for Taiwan, with bipartisan congressional bills such as the Taiwan Travel Act, Taipei Act, Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, and most recently, the passage of the Taiwan Assurance Act. The U.S.-Taiwan relationship is arguably stronger than ever. So now, as the Biden administration steps onto the world stage, the United States faces numerous challenges, challenging decisions as it approaches, it considers its own approach to Taiwan, China, and the cross relationship. Will Biden continue his predecessor's policies of aggressively challenging China while seeking stronger ties with Taiwan? Or will he take a different approach, working to end the ongoing trade war and try to find common ground with Beijing, potentially at the expense of Taipei? How will Beijing attempt to reframe the Taiwan question with the Biden administration? And how will Taipei respond to these new dynamics? So GTI, we're very pleased to assemble the virtual panel today, Taiwan in 2021, to address these questions and attempt to forecast developments in Taiwan, China, and Russia relations in 2021. We have an exceptional group of analysts with us today to really slice and dice these issues and much more. Each of them have lengthy biographies that I will not go into at length. You can find them on our website uh, on the event page and also online. Um, I would introduce them briefly in the order that they will be speaking. First, we'll have David Sachs, who is a research fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and previously worked as the political, uh, for, on political military affairs at the American Institute in Taiwan, Washington office. Next, we have Derek Grossman, who is a senior defense analyst at RAND and served over a decade in the US intelligence community at the DIA and NSA. Next, we have Yun Sun, who is a senior fellow and co-director of the East Asia program and the director of the China program at the Simpson Center, with prior affiliations with the Brookings Institution, as well as the International Crisis Group. Last but not least, we have Vincent Chow, who is the director at the, of the political division at the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States. Prior to this role, he served as chief of staff to Taiwan's foreign minister and senior level positions at the Office of the President and Taiwan's National Security Council. We've asked each of the speakers to prepare about 10 minutes for the opening comments. Then that will be followed by a moderated discussion that I will lead. And then we'll close at the end for, um, for audience Q&A. Uh, for audience members uh, who are participating on this, uh, on this video conference, 
you may submit your questions uh, via YouTube um, or uh, you can may tweet us at Global Taiwan or email uh, your questions uh, to contact at globaltaiwan.org. And make sure to include your name as well as your affiliation uh, with your questions. So with that, David, let me turn it over to you. Great. So uh, thanks, Russell, for having uh, I want to acknowledge as well the important work that GTI does and keeping a focus on this critical uh, U.S.-Taiwan relationship. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about cross-strait relations and the outlook as I see it for 2021. And I guess the top line would be that I believe cross-strait relations have reached an impasse marked by a lack of official exchanges, dialogue, and activity. Both Taiwan and China are not happy with the other side. Both believe they are reacting to moves made by the other side, and neither is likely to make a conciliatory gesture to the other side in order to jumpstart cross-strait dialogue. There has been some escalation as we've seen in, in recent months and weeks, notably China's increased bomber flights over the median line and into Taiwan's ADIS, but importantly, Taiwan has not responded in kind. Here, I would give a lot of credit to President Tsai's calm, level-headed leadership, and we should not assume that another leader would have acted with similar restraint. So I think we should uh, acknowledge that. I would also argue that although both sides are frustrated with one another, at the same time, neither side has high expectations of a breakthrough in the short term. And setting expectations low is probably a good thing at this point. So I do not think that we are entering a year where we will see worrying es escalation dynamics. And to just take a step back and recap how we got here, uh, we do not have communication at an official level, and Beijing blames this on Tsai's refusal to endorse the 92 consensus. So from China's perspective, while Tsai has not explicitly pursued formal independence, she is salami slicing to get there. And officials and scholars in Beijing would point to the revision of textbooks, the emphasis on Taiwanese history as opposed to Chinese history, uh, mo most recently, the new passport covers and the recent call that's under debate now to replace the national symbol. And from Tsai's perspective, the 92 consensus is no longer politically viable on Taiwan. And she went far enough in her first inaugural address when she sought to reassure Beijing the cross-strait relations would be conducted on the basis of the ROC constitution, which is a one China framework. I believe this was a creative formulation and an olive branch to Beijing. And Tsai likely believed Beijing would accept this formulation and uh, have cross-strait dialogue with her. But instead she was told she had handed in an incomplete test paper, quote. So I think we should recognize that Beijing's policies have ensured Tsai does not feel any real pressure domestically to make an overture. China's crackdown on freedoms in Hong Kong, as Russell mentioned, ensured Taiwan's people would have no interest in one country, two systems. And right now that is, uh, it's dead on arrival. China has yet to move off this policy and it keeps putting that forward as its proposal to the people on Taiwan. Its actions in Hong Kong have increased and increased repression on the mainland have also caused most on Taiwan to have no interest in being a part of the PRC. And again, the interest in being a part of the PRC was already low to begin with, it's even lower now because of what we see with Hong Kong, Xinjiang, um, and other forms of repression domestically on the mainland. So due to this, Tsai's reticence toward the mainland is embraced by a large swath of the population. And as I mentioned again, she was rewarded with a landslide re-election victory. In my view, until China puts forward a new policy proposal and approach and changes its practices at home as an example to show Taiwan, there won't be much, if any, incentive for Tsai to extend an olive branch. And just to be clear, I don't see China changing its overall approach to Taiwan in the near term. I think that it'll continue to focus on one country, two systems and the 92 consensus. And threats from Beijing will not move the needle and will in fact push Taiwan further away. We've already seen that Beijing's aggressive tactics helped Tsai win re-election and harmed the KMT. Uh, Beijing's policies are likely to push more Taiwan voters toward the DPP. And from Beijing's perspective, this is counterproductive because it prefers the KMT. Um, but again, its own policies are hurting its, its objectives. And, and, I, and I would note that, of course, the United States plays a role here. 
It can encourage dialogue and communicate its expectations to one or both sides. We've done that in the past and we could do that uh, now or in the future. Here I would note that I'm not aware that the Trump administration made it a priority to encourage such dialogue. So where we stand is that both Beijing and Taipei are waiting for the other side to make the first move, but I don't think either side will make the first move. Uh, and in the meantime, we have seen some increase in tensions, but I don't think that we're in a worrying kind of escalation ladder. So the good news is that I think there is a floor to cross-strait relations, and I think we'll avoid a crisis in the near term. So to highlight a couple of reasons why I think so, as I mentioned up top, I think Tsai Ing-wen has acted responsibly. Some in the deep green camp are likely unhappy with Tsai as they thought she had an opportunity to push harder on an open door during the Trump administration. But I think she effectively worked to improve Taiwan's relationship with the United States while not pushing for changes that would likely have provoked a harsh response from Beijing. She also has looked not to escalate when Beijing has employed pressure tactics, and, and we should acknowledge that. From Beijing's perspective, while it is unhappy with Tsai, it has a lot on its plate and likely does not want to add a crisis over Taiwan to its inbox. Uh, it is looking to reset relations with the United States, uh, boost its economy so that it can reach its pre-COVID level of growth, and it wants to create a positive atmosphere around the 100th anniversary of the CCP, the Winter Olympics, and the next party Congress where she hopes to be put forward for another term. We could argue it both ways that, that China would want to show big progress on Taiwan in order to put Xi forward for another term. But I think that what's more important to the Chinese leadership is to create a positive atmosphere around these three major events coming up. And then again, like the rest of the world, China and Taiwan are still fighting the COVID pandemic. Um, and while Taiwan has been ex extraordinarily successful in, in fighting the pandemic, you know, COVID shows no sign of going away anytime soon. And I think that the top priority for Taipei and Beijing uh, in the coming year will be to ensure COVID remains under control um, in their respective territories. So for 2021, I would expect both China and Taiwan to continue their cross-strait policies. So what this means in practice is that China will continue to employ a mix of carrots and sticks. Uh, on the carrot side, it would be rewarding businesses and individuals who are viewed as friendly toward the mainland. And on the sticks, it would be intimidating Taiwan with bomber flights and punishing those that it sees as being, quote, pro-independence or in the green camp. For Taiwan, I would expect Tsai to continue maintaining the status quo and avoiding taking any particularly provocative steps to escalate tensions. And so I would just put a few questions out for the, for the group here, which is first, will Tsai feel pressure domestically to do more to carve out a separate political identity? So we saw some signs that this might be the case with the recent call to reevaluate the national symbol. And we can get into some of the domestic politics over Taiwan, of course, this was not the DPP, it was the NPP that put that forward, but will Tsai feel like she must respond and embrace these policies? Second, what will the United States do? Uh, will it try to encourage cross-strait dialogue? Again, my impression is that this was not a big priority for the Trump administration, but the Biden administration could take a different view. And in its first statement on cross-strait relations, the State Department urged Beijing to quote, engage in meaningful dialogue with Taiwan's democratically elected representatives, end quote. So will the Biden administration signal to China privately that it expects China to, to engage in dialogue with Taipei? Third, can Taiwan and China cooperate on practical matters even without agreement on the framework for cross-strait relations? So even if we don't have uh, agreement on the 92 consensus or whatever a new formulation would be, can they work on establishing some medical information exchange to ease travel during the pandemic, uh, ways to ease students flying back and forth or create a travel bubble, if you will? Can scholarly exchanges resume even virtually? And of course, there are suspicions on both sides with uh, you know, which scholars are allowed to participate, which aren't, but is there a way to move forward on these kind of lower level, um, kind of more technical issues that might uh, jumpstart or at least put a floor on relations. And I'll just uh, leave it there. 
Excellent, David. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, opening comments. And I think you made an, you know, many excellent points there. And I think the one that stood out to me the most in terms of your observation was, you know, really good point about uh, why you do why you don't see that there would be an escalate escalation ladder in 2021, where you know um, several other experts, both senior um, and and otherwise, have have been pointing uh, this year as a as a potential. Um, you know, um, potential year for uh, an uptick in, 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 in tensions. Um, so, but you, you, I think you presented also several uh, good questions for us to consider uh, in our discussion. But I think, in the interest of making sure that we have um, all the uh, all the for facts and 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 all the uh, all the observations on the table for us uh, before we enter the discussion, let's turn it over to to Derek now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Russell, and thanks, everyone. Good morning from uh, sunny Santa Monica, California here. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I just want <clears throat> to thank uh, Russell and uh, GTI for putting this uh, wonderful discussion together. So I was asked to talk a little bit about how um, the Biden administration uh, may be approaching Taiwan and, uh, and cross-strait relations. So I'm going to start by saying it's an open secret uh, in Taiwan that Taiwan was generally favorable toward the Trump administration's approach, okay? And the switch from Trump to Biden was met with some, some, some significant jitters in Taiwan that, you know, maybe things are going to dramatically change under Biden. Maybe Taiwan will not be uh, as prioritized uh, as it once was under the Trump administration. But I got to say that how many days are we now into the Biden administration? About 14 days or so, right? The early signs are very, very positive for Taiwan, very positive. And in fact, I've sort of fallen out of my chair numerous times seeing some of the things that have happened thus far um, that I thought either would never happen or it's way too soon for them to have happened, but yet they have. So I want to run through some of these these items uh, and, uh, and provide a little bit of analysis on them. So, um, you know, when we look at, for example, Secretary of, well, now Secretary of State Tony Blinken, when he was uh, in his Senate confirmation hearing, he was asked to comment about Pompeo's announcement that the U.S. would end self-imposed limits on contact guidelines, uh, which is, you know, the issue Russell had brought up at the start that that's a pretty significant one for U.S.-Taiwan relations. And he responded by saying <clears throat> that the Biden administration would want to, quote, make sure that we're acting pursuant to the mandate in the act, he meant the Taiwan Assurance Act, that looks at creating more space for contacts. So there was a lot of chatter, you know, about why did Pompeo do this at the end and it's really going to jam up the Biden administration, right? Biden, the Biden administration seems to have embraced that change. We will see. They are conducting a review, I'm sure, of, of, the, of that policy and many other policies on Taiwan. But that statement alone strongly suggests that the Trump administration decision is going to remain in place. And when you look at not just the words, but the deeds, right? So an early deed was that the, the Biden administration decided to invite Taiwan's de facto ambassador, M Madam B. Kim Shao, to Biden's inauguration ceremony. And that represented the first time a Taiwan ambassador had been invited to an inauguration event since 1979, okay? Um, so, so the Biden administration so far is making good on that type of talk. Um, when we look at Tony Blinken in particular, um, he has actually been quite forward-leaning on, on advancing the Taiwan relationship in other areas. For example, in August, um, he endorsed Tsai's decision to lift trade barriers on U.S. pork. And, you know, the pork issue, it's a long-standing and, cont and contentious challenge. Um, but, but by endorsing that decision, uh, it, it, we'll see what happens. But the Biden administration, it may set the stage for negotiations between the U.S. and Taiwan on a future free trade agreement. Tsai expended a lot of political capital on that pork move. And actually, when she did it under the Trump administration, the U.S. trade representative said thank you very much, but then nothing further happened on it. So we'll see what happens now with 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 Biden. And I mean, early on, at least Blinken is supportive of that move. Um, Blinken further affirmed that um, his support for Taiwan's membership in international fora, such as the World Health Organization, which China has blocked for years. Um, and it's also encouraging 
that Biden himself uh, in early 2020 um, said that in his first year in office, he planned to hold a, quote, summit of democracies um, <clears throat> to, in his words, quote, renew the spirit and shared purpose of the nations of the free world. So in this regard, you can think of how does Taiwan fit into a potential summit of democracies? Well, Taiwan is one of the most vibrant democracies, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but in the world. So Taiwan should certainly have a role in that. Uh, and of course, the flip side of it is China is not a democracy. And so China would not be invited to, to such an event. And actually, the event would be about countering China and other authoritarian regimes. So I think Taiwan is in pretty good hands um, in that aspect as well. And then, of course, you know, we have to address the fact that, uh, and David mentioned this, the fact that um, China, uh, you know, in the last week or so has been ramping up uh, military flights into Taiwan's um, air defense identification zone, uh, an unprecedented number, including eight bombers in, 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 one, uh, in one round of it. And the Biden administration was very swift to come out with, I think, a strongly worded statement. I have it here in front of me. The United States notes with concern the pattern of ongoing PRC attempts to intimidate its neighbors, including Taiwan. We urge Beijing to cease its military, diplomatic, and economic pressure against Taiwan and instead engage in meaningful dialogue with Taiwan's democratically elected representatives. The United States maintains its longstanding commitments as outlined in the three communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act, and the six assurances. We will continue to assist Taiwan in maintaining a sufficient self-defense capability. Our commitment to Taiwan is rock solid and contributes to the maintenance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and within the region. You can't really do much better than that, right? So any kind of jitters that Taiwan may have had, I mean, you see a statement like that, that's that's really, really positive. And there are many other positive statements to point to as well. Just in the last day or so, Biden's nominee to become the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Dr. Kat Kathleen Hicks, in Senate testimony, remarked that the U.S. should be crystal clear regarding its defense commitments to Taiwan and providing the island with the necessary defensive equipment that, uh, that it would need. And then within the last few hours, the Biden administration authorized a transit of the Taiwan Strait by a guided missile destroyer. So those transits are going to continue. There's no pulling away from that. In addition, the Biden administration has been forward leaning in the implementation of the Taipei Act. And this is the Taiwan Allies and International Protection and Enhancement Initiative Act, which was passed by Congress in 2019. And the Taipei Act encourages governments and international organizations to enhance their official and unofficial ties with Taiwan. So within the last 24 hours, the U.S. Embassy in Guyana um, applauded Guyana's opening of a Taiwan office in the country to represent Taiwanese interests, even though Taiwan and Guyana do not diplomatically um, recognize each other. So this is really kind of in alignment with full, full throated support of the Taipei Act. Uh, the Biden administration. And the encouraging signs don't just come with respect to U.S.-Taiwan relations, but also on the, uh, the increasing threat that China poses to Taiwan throughout the Indo-Pacific. So, for example, Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, went on Fareed Zakaria's show GPS a few weeks ago, and he labeled China as a strategic competitor. Blinken has also described China in similar terms. And then meanwhile, at DOD, at the Department of Defense, Biden's new Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, even though he has a Middle East background, noted that China would be the, quote, pacing threat for the entire Pentagon. And Biden also appointed a first ever Indo-Pacific coordinator in Kurt Campbell, who greatly appreciates U.S.-China competition, as can be seen throughout his career. He was actually one of the, you know, he was the primary architect, if you will, of the uh, Obama administration's strategic rebalance or pivot to Asia policy. And virtually every political appointee that's been mentioned in news reports recently as becoming, you know, as entering the Biden administration, they're all advocates of winning great power competition. Uh, and they and, for, and, and first and foremost, they believe that the U.S. is in great power competition. That's always a question. You know, are we in great power competition? Pretty much everyone has said we are and that we need to try to win that great power competition. There was another recent report in Axios that stated that ev literally every portfolio in Biden's National Security Council will at least have something to do with China, okay, as part of that competition. So even, you know, climate, health, technology, other, other directorates within the National Security Council that maybe could be siphoned off from China somehow, they all will have something to do with China and will be built into part of Biden's, the Biden administration's China strategy. 
So I think Taiwan should feel pretty good about all of these moves um, and that it, and that essentially Biden is going to continue the Trump administration's approach. But the big question, of course, and I leave this up to Yun Sun and to, and to others, um, is, you know, how is China going to respond? Right. And so it's worrisome that China stepped up these military incursions in recent days, especially in the early days of the Biden administration. <clears throat> there are concerns that maybe Beijing is trying to test the new administration. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, you had Wang Yi out there a few weeks ago, the Chinese foreign minister, calling for a reset in bilateral ties and kind of opening the door to trying to do some business with the United States and get ties back on track because they really spiraled uh, off the rails um, from Beijing's perspective under the Trump administration. So Biden has a phone call planned in less than two weeks with Xi Jinping. So we'll see how that goes. I think we'll get some more information. You know, there's also constant rumor out there that China might, you know, pass this national unification law, similar to what it did with Hong Kong and the national security law in the sense that, you know, really telling Taiwan you're going to be part of one country, two systems, whether you like it or not. And actually, we'll just say you're part of one country, two systems, uh, whether you agree with it or not. <clears throat> so we'll see if that happens. And as David was saying, excuse me, <clears throat> as David was saying, this, you know, this year is the 100th founding of the Chinese Communist Party. So, I mean, I, I, I generally agree with his assessment that that, you know, for that reason and for other reasons for the Beijing, you know, for the 2022 Olympics and because of the um, the um, 20th uh, Congress uh, Party Congress that's coming up, that chi China will certainly want to kind of keep things quieter than usual. But I mean, all you need is one accident in Taiwan's aid is right. One miscalculation that could quickly ramp up to armed conflict uh, or or short of armed conflict, but sustained tensions over time that could eventually draw in the United States. So never say never, but generally speaking, I think things are probably going to stay relatively quiet for 2021. Uh, and, um, you know, we have to look at what Biden has done with the Biden administration has done in a short two week span and say that it's looking pretty positive for Taiwan. So let's see if that continues. And with that, I yield back my time to Russell. Thanks. Wonderful job, Derek. I think you did, you know, a lot, you were able to cover a lot of grounds there in, in a very short uh, period of time. And I especially liked how you, you know, frame Taiwan, what you see as sort of the uh, continuity in Taiwan policy within uh, a broader context of other uh, developments in U.S. policy towards Asia or foreign policy in general. And I think, you know, I think I generally agree with your, your, your analysis and assessments um, there. Um, and now we've had, you know, David give us the trend lines and cross rate relations and also what he sees as internal dynamics in within Taiwan that can uh, affect uh, cross rate relations. We got Derek with uh, his assessment on, um, you know, content, you know, it's the constant th uh, threads in U.S. policy towards Taiwan. Now I want to turn it over to Yun. Um, you know, we will have a, I think, probably the, the hardest task of really giving us her analysis and her assessment on um, where she sees Beijing going in, in um, you know, in uh, in trying to reframe or uh, the uh, the question uh, about Taiwan uh, in relations with the new Biden administration. Yun, over to you. Thank you, Russell, and thanks to GTI for this invitation. And in particular, I would like to echo my uh, co-panelist on the applauding for GTI to GTI for your continued effort to keep this conversation stimulated and always with new ideas and new events. So thank you very much for that. Um, I was tasked with uh, the discussion on where China is, and especially given the inauguration of the Trump, and, uh, I'm sorry, the Biden administration, and uh, what are the policy implications and how does that affect China's calculation? So I will cover that. And I will also cover something that people probably have noticed that has been going on in China, which I know that has generated a lot of debate here about this, uh, this, this seems to be ongoing heated debate in China on um, whether China is going to go for unification by force or China is still sticking to the principle of uh, unification by peace. So we've been doing some research about what is really embedded in this, in this debate, whether it is a real debate or it actually stands for something else. So to begin with, um, we all know that after four years of Trump administration, especially the uh, fluctuation and the absence downs with uh, well, basically in Beijing's perspective, only downs, no ups uh, in the past one year on the, uh, on the issue of Taiwan, 
Um, Taiwan is the one issue that um, China has wanted most out of the Biden administration, uh, which is a, a promise of stability and a commitment that U.S. is not going to test China's red line on the issue of Taiwan. So Taiwan is that one issue where Beijing has been asking for reassurances from, uh, from Washington. So this is quite evident in almost all the public statements uh, that China has made towards the United States since the um, election last November here in, uh, in the United States, and also in the discussions that um, people have participated in, in the track to, uh, track to dialogue between US and China. So the one thing that the Chinese side has been emphasizing and has been vigorously demanding is a reiteration by the Biden administration that US policy towards Taiwan has not, has not changed. And I think on that point, the statement from uh, State Department yesterday, which reiterate one China policy, has provided some satisfaction and some sense of reassurance to, uh, to Beijing. But very rapidly after the statement was made um, yesterday, there are also uh, different voices within China that's emerging on that point. So one voice is emphasizing that, well, on the same day, American destroyers uh, just sailed through the Taiwan Strait. So this, the, the statement and the, uh, the, the sale itself uh, suggests the duality of the U.S. policy towards Taiwan is not going to, is not going to stop. Therefore, China still needs to prepare for this military conflict. And the other voice starts to emphasize this, uh, this theory of uh, abandonment, U.S. abandonment of Taiwan, and how that potentially could flare up, which I think neither is quite a true or accurate reflection of, uh, of, of where U.S. actually is. So where is China on the uh, U.S.-China relations today? China has hoped very vigorously that the Biden administration will restart or reset the um, U.S.-China relations, or at least to reverse the free fall of the bilateral relations that people saw under the, um, especially the last year of the Trump administration. But I would also say that in the past two weeks, the Chinese expectations has been dropping. And there are two reasons for it. The first one is the Biden administration doesn't seem to have a very passionate or enthusiastic reaction to the Chinese request for one, uh, a, a date for a future meeting between Xi Jinping and Biden, two, a phone call between Xi Jinping and Biden. And when those two fail, the Chinese also circulate the, the, um, the, the potential that maybe uh, Politburo member Yang Jiechi could pay a visit to Washington to have consultations with the, uh, with the Biden administration, and that has not been uh, accepted either. And the second reason that I think the Chinese expectation is dropping is that, well, it raises a question that the Chinese desire for reset, is that a tactical maneuver or does it really reflect China's strategic desire to reset the bilateral relations? And how sincere this uh, this demand for reset really really is, and judging by what we saw coming out of the Chinese Foreign Ministry and also from Yang Jiechi earlier this week when he gave his talk in uh, on, online at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, we know that China continues to blame everything and all the problems on the United States, demanding that the United States correct its mistakes and draw the Chinese red lines again on Taiwan, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Tibet. So the question I think people have is that why would Yang Jiechi and Chinese Foreign Ministry make such moves knowing that there's almost no chance that it will be received well by the, uh, by the US side? And there are two explanations. The first one is that Yang and his colleagues position as a serving political, political agenda, feeding domestic audience and fulfilling the political tasks rather than genuinely aimed at rebooting relations with the United States. So it is well understood that the top leaders in China is unlikely to change his current political position. So um, the best strategy for the, for, the, for the foreign policy apparatus is to make their best effort. And the second, excuse me, the second explanation is that knowing that China probably has no interest in making concessions, because uh, while China believes that it has weathered the storm, both the storm of the Trump administration and the storm of COVID. So as a result of that, China still believes that the power equilibrium is tilting in China's favor. So all these, pre, uh, all these diplomatic outreach 
are tactical maneuvers instead of reflecting a genuine strategic shift in China's strategy towards the United States. So reflecting on Taiwan issue, we see something strange. Um, that is, although on one hand, we see that China wants to reset the relationship with the United States under Biden, but on the other hand, China's military pressure and its coercive posture on Taiwan issue has not mitigated at all. And the most obvious um, case here, at, and, and this has been mentioned, is that three days after Biden's inauguration, China launched 28 incursions into Taiwan airspace by the PLA. And this in the past has been used as a retaliation to Trump administration's action to support Taiwan, according to the Chinese argument. But if you think about it, three days into his uh, his term, Biden hasn't really done anything on Taiwan yet. So for China to, to almost preemptively to take these type of actions, um, there are Chinese pundits and experts pointing out that China is trying to set up the rules with Biden administration and try to prevail over the, the opponent in the first encounter. And that leads to another question. So in the next following couple of years, what is the true nature, what the true position, the bottom line of China's policy towards, uh, towards Taiwan? I personally don't believe that the inauguration of Biden administration has fundamentally changed China's approach to Taiwan, which is China prefers peaceful unification, prepares for military unification, but it will always use its coercion when Taiwan doesn't seem to be going in the direction that China wants to see. And the Chinese think coercion is an option imposed on them because Taiwan's reluctance to re embrace peaceful unification and I think the coercive trend is only going to intensify as Taiwan progresses on its own path in its, and in, in its own direction. So very uh, starting from last year, one thing that we have noticed is that in the Chinese, uh, the mainland Taiwan policy community, there has been this fierce debate between people who support unification by peace and unification by force. So starting with a series of nine articles by Chinese and Taiwanese scholars on China Times in July last year, the, the Chinese policy community has been unprecedentedly di divided in a highly polarizing, emotionally charged and personal debate. So for example, in his July 13 article, Zhang Nianzhi called for the more tolerance by Beijing of, tai of Taiwan's political reality and the more understanding of Taiwan's historical experience, hence Taiwan people's preferences. His policy recommendation was centered on the broadest possible interpretation of one China and the maximum accommodation of Taiwan's political demands. And this article angered the ultra nationalistic conservative hawks in China, who saw his position as supportive of Taiwan independence and undermining Beijing's unification agenda. And the people who support unification suddenly became the leader of a so called appeasement movement. So in a counter argument published by Li Yi from Fuzhou University, the whole Taiwan policy community uh, or the apparatus of China was accused of being bureaucratic, incompetent, and shifting blames for their failure on unification. His accusation was so vehement and inclusive of the whole Taiwan policy circle that Chen Kongli, the 90-year-old pioneer of Taiwan studies in China, came out to publicly rebuff him. And his rebuttal is focused on the fact that peaceful unification, including ACFA and economic integration, is a policy made by the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. So by accusing the Taiwan experts, Li Yi is literally challenging the top leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. The central issue of the debate is that 90% of the Chinese public opinion in mainland China supports unification by force. Despite the fact that Xi Jinping still defines peaceful unification as China's policy with the use of force as a reactive option, the voice calling for unification by force is exceedingly strong in the Chinese, in the Chinese public sphere. Given that such a large gap that almost borders direct challenge to Xi's policy is politically unthinkable in China today. So I guess the question that people do raise is that where does that public opinion come from? The examination probably offers a disturbing and inconvenient choose. And that is the hawkish public opinion is not organic, but created by the government for political needs to create, 
maintain and radicalize such public opinions in mainland China to confront the development in Taiwan and in U.S.-Taiwan relations as neither peaceful unification nor unification by force is likely in the, in the foreseeable future. So in this sense, the so-called debate between the peace and use of force has very little to do with different approaches or intellectual convictions. And in reality, they're just the political maneuvers by the Chinese mainland government so that they can use the public opinion to confront the DPP and to confront Washington. I think the frustration for the uh, proponents or the supporters of peaceful unification lies in the fact that the leaders have told them that peaceful unification is a way to go. But at the same time, the government is also pushing the opposite narrative to serve the political needs. So the result is quite um, is, is, is blame shifting that Beijing has to create this public opinion and create the argument for uh, military unification because the U.S. has increasingly played the Taiwan card for geopolitical campaigns against China. So in the long run, for China's policy, like I mentioned, China still prefers mini, uh, peaceful unification over the use of force. However, in the Chinese policy lexicon, coercion is not unpeaceful. China's confidence in unification lies in the belief that there will be a day that the U.S. is exhausted by the security commitment to an island so far away as power balance continues to tilt in China's favor. Therefore, when and only when the U.S. withdraws, will Taiwan's political will to negotiate a peaceful unification with China begin to emerge. So this calculation dictates that China must respond militarily to Taiwan's moves, quote, quote, toward independence before that day comes. And this growing confidence in the shifting power balance in Beijing also fosters growing Chinese tolerance or even neutrality towards military risks. And I think that is the biggest danger that we're looking at across the Taiwan Strait in the next four years. Thank you very much, Russell. I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent, Yun. Um, really interesting uh, insights there and your analysis of Chinese debate. Um, uh, on Taiwan policy, I, I especially like your um, your your distinction between the tactical and strategic uh, approaches um, in um, the motivation of uh, Chinese adjustments in uh, its um, approach to Taiwan, and and also you know the distinction between a a, a, a fundamental change and and that which is perhaps just you know gloss over. It's, um, it's 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 underlying motivation, which has um, I think you've um, you know sort of pinpointed as having no indication of of, of changing it, at least in uh, visibly. Um, you know I um, you know there's a a um, there was an interesting speech that um, that uh, Wang Yang uh, recently gave at the Taiwan Work Conference, um, the annual Work Conference, and I and I'm just presenting it here because I do want to get to this one. In our discussion, but in it, I believe he had admitted reference to one country, two systems, and also peaceful unification. So those two terminologies have been uh, somehow admitted, and this was uh, picked up on by um, you know various media outlets. And so I, I do want to get your take, um, you know, later on in our Q and A about what you think that may mean. Um, but but before we do that, I do want to give Vincent the chance to really give us. Uh, his take, uh, his assessment, uh, really Taiwan's perspective, his own personal assessments, of course, also as well, uh, on um, you know really the uh, where where uh, what direction we're going. Hi, um, hello everybody. Thanks to Russell and the team at GTI for holding this event. I'm in basically broad agreement with what the other panelists have uh, spoken about. But let me just quickly start uh, by rehashing a couple of our recent events. So the first one, as Derek pointed out, uh, contrary to some media speculation in Taiwan. Taiwan was well represented at President Biden's inauguration on January 20th. And as our Ministry of Foreign Affairs had pointed out, this was a significant step forward. And it was a strong reflection of the Biden team's position on Taiwan and the continuing ties that we will share. Um, the second one was a few days after inauguration, um, the State Department had released a press statement titled uh, PRC Military Pressure Against Taiwan Threatens Regional Peace and Stability. So this was a response to as the other panelists have pointed out large scale PRC military exercises in Taiwan's vicinity, uh, both on January 23rd and the 24th. And these were the latest in the long term of a long line of provocative military actions that the PRC has 
undertaken with both increasing increasingly uh, frequency and scope. The response from the State Department was pretty clear in terms of U.S. support. It not only called out ongoing PRC attempts to intimidate its neighbors, including Taiwan, but it also reinforced um, the six assurances, as well as emphasized that the U.S. commitment to Taiwan is, quote unquote, rock solid. Statements like this ultimately help maintain peace and stability by showing that Taiwan does not stand alone against PRC military provocations. Uh, the third event was just yesterday. Uh, Taiwan had announced that we would be setting up a new Taiwan office in Guyana, which continues the trend of enlarging our international presence, particularly in areas where Taiwan has been underrepresented in the past. So it is also the second overseas office established recently that uses the name Taiwan. So the office will help promote cooperation areas such as agricultural, education, investment and trade. So we saw this invest, uh, this action was immediately welcomed by the State Department, Acting Assistant Secretary Julie Chung said, um, quote, the U.S. welcomes the establishment of a Taiwan office in Guyana, which will strengthen their growing relationship, end quote. The U.S. embassy in Guyana also applauded the decision by saying that closer ties with Taiwan would advance uh, cooperation and development on a basis of shared democratic values, transparency, and mutual respect. So at, as all of these early actions show, uh, we have no doubt that the strong trajectory of Taiwan-U.S. relations will continue in the years ahead. We understand that one of the focuses of the Biden team will be to work with allies and partners with a premium placed on multilateral and international cooperation. So in both these areas, we believe that there is significant opportunity for Taiwan. The U.S. decision to rejoin the, uh, the WHO, for example, means that, they will, that it will be in a strong position to hold the organization accountable, ensure transparency and support Taiwan's participation together with other like-minded countries. And similarly, in terms of Interpol, ICAO, and other UN or international bodies, we believe that many like-minded countries will also look towards U.S. leadership, particularly on Taiwan issues. So this is why U.S. leadership continues to be very important. The same holds true for other facets of international space. So Secretary Blinken had said during his nomination hearing, and I quote, he said, I'd like to see Taiwan even more engaged in the world. So we will continue to work with Secretary Blinken team at the State Department to explore more opportunities in terms of our diplomatic allies, cooperation on regional and global issues, and further expansion of the GCTF program, particularly in light of um, increased funding both from the U.S. and Taiwan. So on security, um, as a number of senior officials had said during their nomination hearings, uh, maintaining Taiwan's defensive deterrence is a high priority. We see support for Taiwan's defense, which includes priorities on asymmetric capabilities, force reform and further utilization of the reserve system as very much bipartisan and in line with both our interests and values and objectives. We will continue to work with the new administration to identify and engage on further necessary arms procurements to provide for our own credible defense and deter the CCP from military adventurism. On the, uh, on the economy, so we're very much heartened by the fact that uh, a number of economic engagements have already taken place, are taking place, and more that uh, soon will take place. Um, the discussions that we've held over the past year on semiconductors, uh, supply chain security, and other pressing economic matters continue to be very much relevant today. So we look forward to continuing this momentum. Trade, of course, still remains our major object objective. So this includes both bilateral and multilateral trade. On Capitol Hill, there is still strong bipartisan support for engaging in bilateral trade discussions, which we believe is in line with both our broad economic and trade interests. The Biden team's prioritization of high quality labor and environmental standards actually means greater opportunities for Taiwan, given the quality of our econo economy and what we would be able to bring to the table. So this will be a priority topic for us going forward. On multilateral engagements, uh, the UK's application to join CPTPP will coalesce uh, international discussions about new membership. And so we certainly hope Taiwan can be a part of these uh, talks. Now, outside of these existing topics, the Biden administration also brings further opportunities to engage on issues ranging from climate change to democracy promotion and other soft power topics. On, on climate change, Taiwan has made uh, great strides, mostly under the radar, but great strides, increasing ratio of uh, our renewable energy, uh, providing technological solutions to urban transit and reducing the amount of harmful CO2 emissions emitted by our existing uh, power plants. So we have a lot of industry leading companies that are involved in these areas and we see ample, ample opportunity for Taiwan to enhance its cooperation 
with this new administration, both bilaterally and multilaterally, so that um, so that we can achieve our shared uh, goals of averting uh, climate change. And this will be an issue we look forward uh, to engaging on. Now, in terms of democracy promotion, and some other panelists have mentioned this previously, uh, we have taken note of President Biden's desire to hold a democracy summit. So we see this as great news. And other than our government, uh, many of our think tanks and NGOs, such as the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, are deeply involved in this area. So we will seek to uh, play a suitable role in terms of contributing to this overall cause. So to sum up uh, everything I've said, let me echo what uh, Representative Xiao had said just a few days earlier at another event, which is we're really off to a great start right now. Uh, we see enormous overlap in terms of our priorities, interests, and values. And so we look forward to deepening our work with the current administration in the years ahead. Thank you. Benson, thank you so much um, you know, for really giving us, uh, I think, you know, your um, affirmative uh, observations and statements with regards to how you see um, developments of uh, the early indicators um, from the Biden administration and and, and where you see us Taiwan relations uh, moving uh, going forward um, and this is actually perfect it gives us a uh, we have ample time for for discussion um, again a reminder for our online audience members uh, you can ask, submit your questions uh, either by using the, um, the chat function on the YouTube page. Uh, it should be on the right side of your screen. Uh, or you can tweet us at, uh, at Global Taiwan. Uh, or you may uh, send, uh, submit your, send your questions by email to at contact at globaltaiwan.org. I can see from my colleague that we have already received several um good questions and um so just remember to um include your name as well as your affiliation uh with uh with your question so now i want to exercise the uh the moderator's prerogative and um and uh, i present a few questions um for our panelists uh to hopefully stimulate some uh discussion uh in furtherance of some of the topics that were raised but also raise some uh, new areas uh, that perhaps weren't um, uh, addressed by uh, by our by our esteemed um, experts. Uh, one of the questions that I had I want to pose for the entire group, and this is something I hope maybe you can all sort of chime in on. But you know, oftentimes our discussions about policy can seem a little bit highbrow and and, and a little bit um, perhaps um, you know sort of abstract. Um, you know, which is why I always think that it's important to factor in, um, you know, public opinion and polling that's done when we have them. And, and oftentimes there aren't um, that many. But I think in recent time, we've seen quite a few number of surveys that have been conducted by, you know, a reputable U.S. think tanks um, uh, that I think can help us anchor our discussion. And so uh, in October of last year, uh, some of you uh, may be familiar, the CSIS, a D.C. think tank, released the results of an extensive survey that they conducted on mapping the future of US-China policy. Uh, the results of that, I think, survey was quite interesting since it reflects um, how US thought leaders and the public consider taking on a, a, a level of considerable risks uh, to defend uh, Taiwan, uh, which is on par with you know, treaty allies of the United States, such as Australia, Japan, and South Korea, and even higher than that for you know, um, the South China Sea. And in addition, on average, public support for taking on risk to defend Taiwan is even higher than that for Australia and just slightly below that for Japan and South Korea, both treaty allies of the United States. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, these survey results, the trend line seems to be consistent with an upward trend in, in, um, in public's, you know, sort of support for the use of military force to respond to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. But even still, that level of public support, at least the one conducted by Chicago Council, um, uh, indicates that the number, the percentage is really only at about 38 um, percent that support the use of military force in response to, uh, you know, to to um, to Chinese invasion of, of Taiwan. So the qu all that to set up the question here is, you know, is there a perception gap in U.S.-Taiwan relations? Here and if so, what does this mean for the future of uh, you know U.S. policy towards Taiwan? Uh, any of the you know any of the uh, panelists would like to take that? I 
could take a shot at it, Russell. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm glad that you mentioned the Chicago Council on Global Affairs survey, which just came out and did have a worrying gap where uh, opinion leaders, regardless of party affiliation, overwhelmingly supported using U.S. force to defend Taiwan, but the public did show some fatigue with U.S. military intervention, which I think you can is understandable after Iraq and Afghanistan. So I think that there's a couple of things that we should do. I mean, you know, uh, U.S. policymakers generally don't talk about Taiwan at length to domestic audiences, I think, around the United States. You know, they they signal to China how we view the issue, uh, but that's read in Beijing and Taipei. It's not read across America. So I think one thing that the Biden administration could do is really work in a discussion of our interests at stake and our relationship with Taiwan domestically. When Secretary Blinken or the assistant secretaries or deputy assistant secretaries speak at um, public forums. And but I, I do think that we should take all these surveys with a, with a grain of salt because we don't know what it'll look like should um, there be a use of force against Taiwan. I mean, of course, on all of our TV screens would be a democracy under attack by an authoritarian regime in, in East Asia. Um, there's so much that we don't know about about what it would look like. So I, I think that we need to be careful about saying, well, most Americans would not support the use of force to, to defend Taiwan. We just really don't know what the circumstances would be and, and what it would look like, you know, frankly, on our TV screens and in our newspapers. I mean, one thing that I that I think is important that I would just highlight is that should there be, uh, you know, an, a, an, a, a use of force against Taiwan and we don't want to think about it, but, but obviously we need to, is that, you know, obviously Taiwan needs to be in the fight. And it's important how the Taiwan military and the population responds to a Chinese use of force. And I think that will bear a lot on on how the United States, how our public and our policymakers um, view view what a U.S. response should be. You go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Russell. Um, and I, I just want to add something to this as uh, that. Well, I started to think about this with the, with the debate last year about strategic ambiguity and the discussion about uh, the cost imposing strategy that the primary U.S. strategy coming to the Chinese threat to Taiwan is to increase the cost of the Chinese action, right? And since, well, I think most people would agree that the only real defense strategy for Taiwan involves the United States, the key and commitment to Taiwan's defense needs to be based on solid U.S. capability. And we all agree, we all agree on that. So the capability focused approach will increase the cost of the Chinese military campaign against Taiwan. But I would also like to point out that its effectiveness will very largely depend on how China calculates and perceives the relative cost, which compares the cost to the United States and Taiwan on one hand, and the cost imposed on China on the other hand. What that means is um, the Chinese do not question the U.S. military superiority over China, and they do not dispute that such superiority will probably continue for the decades to come. However, what is also clear to Beijing is that China's strategic resolve to fight a war over Taiwan is, uh, is absolute, while such U.S. resolve has been at best ambivalent. So this does not suggest that Beijing will initiate a military campaign, and it doesn't mean that that initiation is imminent, is imminent. but it does underscore the asymmetry nature in the strategic resolve between the U.S. and China in fighting a war over Taiwan. So in um, because I focus primarily on China, I'll, I'll just mention this. In China's current calculation, if a war breaks out over Taiwan, there are only two possible outcomes. One, China prevails and takes over Taiwan by force. Or two, China fails and resorts to the threat or the use of total destruction. A scenario where U.S. prevails and Taiwan gains independence is not an option in Beijing's playbook, as the independence of Taiwan on Xi Jinping's or any Chinese leader's watch will bankrupt not only his legitimacy, but also that of the Communist Party. So I think Beijing prefers the first option and keeps the second option as a last resort. So in the views of the Chinese, the U.S. might feel obligated to intervene, but it will not be willing to, willing or able to risk as much as, Ta as China would be for Taiwan. So the asymmetry in their strategic resolve determines that the asymmetry of the tolerance of the risks 
and also for human and material losses. I'm not advocating for China to use force, and I'm not advocating for U.S. to fold, but I am advocating that when we talk about a military scenario over the Taiwan Strait, we are talking about not only the capability, but also a contest of the strategic resolves. Thank you. Well, that's a, that's an that's a, that's excellent point on, um, you know, I think, you know, highlighting the strategic resolve and the psychological component of the cross-strait um, balance, if you will. Uh, oftentimes that discussion is focused on, you know, military balance, but an important function of that is the um, is morale. And I, I think psychological uh, component, which is often a missing element in our discussion about how um, uh, China's approach to uh, to Taiwan, and I, I think this kind of kind of goes into we're kind of sort of gravitating towards the um, towards this uh, security um, uh, aspects of this uh, the Taiwan Strait here, um, and I want to bring Derek uh, you into this conversation. Um, you know, I think uh, both Vincent David um, have um, have both you know uh, emphasized the importance of deterrence. Matt Pottinger, the former deputy national security advisor, just spoke at a recent event, um, you know, uh, on the need to uh, to take substantive actions that can deter, you know, China. Uh, so, and the Trump administration, uh, to its credit, has you know really been um, really at the forefront on um, approving, uh, you know, uh, providing Taiwan with the capabilities, um, new capabilities over the past four years. At this point now, what capabilities? Capabilities you think Taiwan needs uh, that it does not have enough of to deter a, a Chinese invasion? Yeah, thanks, Russell. Um, so, I mean, I think I think under the Trump administration, um, uh, many of the types of things that Taiwan would need uh, to to integrate into its new um, asymmetric defense strategy, uh, its overall defense concept or strategy were provided to Taiwan. Uh, and so, you know, these are these are things of an asymmetric nature. I mean, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I want to see that continue under the Biden administration. Uh, and I think it will. But I mean, there's also kind of a question about whether the Trump administration has already provided the vast majority of that equipment. And Taiwan doesn't really need as much of that anymore and is going to kind of move on to different things, right? So, I mean, one of the things that's always in the you know in the headlines is you know will Taiwan maybe one day get access to the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter right uh, and it's specifically the F-35B because it does have the short landing and takeoff capability during the outset of a conflict China is most likely going to crater runways right so you're going to need aircraft that are able to get off the ground with minimal run run um, runway space. So, I mean, that's something that, you know, we may see Taiwan kind of move on to in the coming years. I don't know that it'll be necessarily during the Biden administration, but in the coming years, I think there will be increasing interest in that. I mean, maybe Vincent can uh, can tell me otherwise. Um, but, you know, that's that's one aspect. I mean, another, of course, is that Taiwan wants to have the indigenous uh, defensive submarine program up and running in the next few years and the extent to which the U.S., is willing and can support that type of program, I think will be very interesting and something to stay attuned to. But I mean, asymmetrically, I mean, th a lot of these things are cheap, like sea mines, right? Uh, more anti-ship cruise missiles, uh, you know, things of that nature, which I think, you know, Trump, the Trump administration and the Biden administration, or excuse me, the Obama administration before it had already been doing some of that. So we may see Taiwan not needing as much of that equipment in the future and moving on to sort of like the more conventional capabilities that can supplement and augment what it's doing asymmetrically. Thanks, Eric. Um, now, uh, you know, in the various uh, presentations that we've heard um, already from each one of you, you know, there was obviously uh, a lot of references to the uh, the lifting of the contact guidelines um, uh, with Taiwan by uh, Secretary Pompeo. Um, David, I want to bring you into this because you're, you know, you worked at AIT Washington here, um, you know, and I wanted to get your take on, you know, and, and others to who may want to chime in here. What, did they, what does that mean in, in real practical terms, you know, now at this point that those the guidelines have been lifted? And, and what do you think, how likely are the are these contact guidelines going to be continued uh, and to what extent um, under the uh, under the Biden administration? Sure. So 
it's hard to tell really um, how much will change because it was just a very brief statement towards the tail end of the Trump administration. My understanding is that the task will go to AIT Washington to review proposed contacts and to advise or approve them and that the gist of Secretary Pompeo's announcement was essentially ceding that authority or ceding that um, task from EAP to AIT. So the real question, though, is, um, you know, the extent to which AIT has the capability to implement it. Obviously, it's a it's a smaller staff. Are you asking these people to look at every proposed interaction by a U.S. ambassador abroad? with Taiwan's ambassador or representative, it's, it, that's a huge ask. So I really don't think we know enough about how it'll be implemented and what the scope that they were looking at is. I don't think that the Biden administration will, quote, reimpose the restrictions. But what I do think we should think about is that the last time these were really evaluated in a holistic way was during a very broad Taiwan policy review in the mid 90s which was coordinated by the National Security Council, which brought in the State Department and the Commerce Department and Defense and, and all these other people. And they looked at the contact guidelines and said, where does it serve our interests? Where should we change it? And it was made in a literal point by point um, decision memo, right? Where it said, here's our current policy. Here are, are multiple options where we could change it. What should we pick? And it could be time, you know, it's been about 25 years now right, a quarter of a century, it could be time to look for another Taiwan policy review, that we shouldn't just look at contact guidelines. Let's look at the entire relationship. What are our objectives with this relationship? What are our interests? And how can we best meet those objectives? Uh, some of it is contact guidelines. Some of it is more substantive policy. But let's get the NSC, um, which plays, which is supposed to play a coordinating role to get the right people in the room, look at the entire breadth of our relationship and look at what's outdated, what needs to change and, and what should stay the same because it continues to serve our interests. So I would say that, say what you want about the contact guidelines. Uh, you know, you can say it was a good decision to lift them, it was a bad decision, but I would just argue that the hastiness was not, was not good. Um, that we should take a holistic view of our relationship. Contact guidelines are one piece of that. And then let's see what should change. Uh, let's look at trade policy. Let's look at um, our policy with um, providing defensive articles to Taiwan, training, um, exercises, doctrine development. Let's look at everything that we need to do and, and let's make decisions. And as I'm sure you understand better than and many others as well, David, that, that, that when you bring in such a comprehensive package, it, it, it can often easily get bogged down in the bureaucratic process. So, but so I think that maybe if I were to sort of uh, you know uh, put in a word of defense for the the, the the decision, you know, it's better late than never, right? Um, so, um, but nonetheless, um, Vincent, I have a question for you. Um, you know, it's been brought up a number of times just in our conversation today. Um, but, you know, how do you respond to some experts concern that a move to strategic clarity by the United States would essentially give or could give, you know, Taiwan essentially a blank check? And while, um, you know, even though the current administration in Taiwan may be careful and, and measured in its approach to cross strait relations, others in the future may not be as much. Um, how do you respond to these uh, concerns? And, and, and and, um, you know, assuming that you agree that it is necessary for there to be greater clarity in U.S. commitment to defend Taiwan, why is it necessary? Russell, that's a tough question. Uh, thanks for leaving that one for me. Um, <laughs> but I, I, if I could just go back about 10 minutes earlier and, and just speak a bit about defense, because it's related to this issue as well. And I wanted to come back to the issue that, that uh, David had raised about U.S. domestic considerations and Serene had raised about U.S. intervention efforts. And, you know, I think there's a there's a there's a role in all of this, a huge role and perhaps the most important role, which is Taiwan's own self-defense capabilities and Taiwan's own self-defense efforts and how that factors into that overall question about deterrence. And I think from what President Tsai has done since 2016, she's very much emphasized that role, which is that Taiwan, you know, Taiwan ultimately is, is responsible for our own self-defense. And this was the inspiration 
why um, we we had this monumental shift in defense strategy to ODC, why there has been this focus on asymmetric capabilities, why she has increased the budget pretty consistently over the past couple of years to the degree where you know no administration in recent history has done in Taiwan. So President Tsai very much understands that. And and I think that's broadly related to this question, which is can Taiwan defend defend itself? And I think you know that answer obviously depends on many factors, both external and internal. But I think there is broad um, has been broad discussions, and there has been uh, widely published literature on this that Taiwan is capable of defending itself, provided that Taiwan continues to make this right these right uh, decisions on defense in the years ahead. So, so I think there there is um, that role to play that that has been under discussed, and and that very much I think will play into how, how the U.S. chooses to respond in any such scenario, because again, it's related to this. To this, to this, this both this internal determination part, but also this question about how much of a role the U.S. can play in that sort of situation, because Taiwan would be able to hold on for a certain amount of time, or Taiwan would be able to do some, uh, augment um, other actions that people could take. So, so I mean that. Oh, and and to Derek's point about the F-35s, I think you know I'm just going to wade headfirst into that into this by saying that I, I think there's still. A lot of discussion that needs to be had in terms of how that would fit into this, how uh, this overall defense strategy. So I, I don't have an answer on that specifically, but you know, to your point about cheap cap capabilities, uh, I mean, those certainly aren't cheap capabilities, and and to a certain extent, CDCMs and C mines are cheaper capabilities that that would very much fit within um, that overall picture. So now, in terms of Russell's point on strategic clarity, see, I, I've made this point before, and and feel free to disagree with me, but. I don't believe there is absolute strategic clarity on anything you do, uh, particularly when you, you're coming down to like an obligation, as many people have referred to it, to defend Taiwan. I think even if you look at the defense treaty between the U.S. and Japan, or the previous defense treaty between the Taiwan and ROC, you know there was no absolute obligation. I mean, certainly, you know there there is I think an implied commitment, uh, but but I mean. I think even that would depend on a number of different factors. And so, you know, I, I think that the debate has gradually moved on from strategic clarity. And I think there has been kind of the, both the pros and cons to it. But certainly from my own personal perspective, you know, I'm not sure how much um, this whole conversation benefits this discussion, because I, I have always personally thought that it was much more important to make sure that we do the things that we need to do in terms of strengthening our own defense rather than to get bogged down in this conversation about strategic ambiguity versus strategic clarity, because I, I, I just don't see how, you know, that is um, an ironclad commitment in any sense of the word or a commitment that would necessarily tie in future governments, both in Taiwan or the United States. But, but sorry, that's, that's my own personal perspective. Sure, Vincent, thank you. Um, thank you for that clarification. Uh, and I would just add that I think you're absolutely right in the sense that, you know, at the very least, this debate um, is, uh, is, is, has shifted somewhat from, I think, what, um, you know, David Sachs, whom, you know, co-authored that, uh, I think, um, a really um, thought-provoking uh, piece in the foreign affairs with, his, with Richard Haas, you know, that really, um, really, I think, really kicked this debate into high gear. Um, but that it was never sort of unconditional, right? And I think somehow the, the criticism with regards to some of the, the this approach uh, was assume, assuming that somehow a, a, any guarantee would be somewhat unconditional. And I don't think that that was either the intention or really realistically uh, the, um, the um, anyone sort of taking that as sort of an unconditional guarantee. And so there would always be, you know, I think some type of, um, you know, um, uh, conditions there and, and trust that would be necessary in order for, there to be um, the type of um, uh, uh, protection uh, that such a commitment um, would afford, and, and, and in some ways, in certain situations, uh, would be um, would could be very would be necessary. Um, I do want to get to the audience Q and A. I have you know a lot of more questions that I have lined up for for um, our panelists, but I do want to give our audience members um, the opportunity to engage in our conversation. And so the first question here is from, uh, and for those who, again, who haven't posed your questions yet, you may do so uh, utilizing the YouTube function, the chat function on YouTube. Uh, tweet us at Global Taiwan, and also uh, we're sending your questions via uh, contact at globaltaiwan.org. First question is from uh, Tina Chong over at The Voice of America. 
Uh, this relates to uh, the decision to uh, uh, Taiwan's decision to um, set up a diplomatic office in Guyana. And specifically, uh, the question is, what goals can Taiwan achieve substantively and symbolically by this uh, diplomatic move? And will it have any impact on U.S.-China competition or influence in Latin America? What's the, uh, what's the take here on the, uh, on, the, on the panel? It wasn't addressed to anyone. So if um, you know, anyone can jump on this one, um, if you'd like. Well, uh, Russell, perhaps I could take the first part of that question. And, and you know, Samin and many others are experts on the second part of the question. But, um, well, I mean, overall, I would still refer um, the questions about this uh, back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Taiwan. But what I can say, I think, from my own personal perspective is that is that I think we're jumping and gun a bit here. And it's, it's a bit too early to talk about, you know, what can we achieve? What is the substance? When in reality, what about, you know, a new friendship? And we're talking about building this friendship up. And I think, you know, we're jumping two steps ahead by saying, oh, what can we achieve out of this when the friendship has just essentially begun? And so I, I think um, the whole, um, the fact that it took place um, and the fact that, you know, that, that there was this, press statement, the fact that the U.S. Uh, has really welcomed it and expressed its support of it, I think it says a lot about the direction that this is taking right now. And in terms of, I think, the results and the substance of it, I think, you know, we should maybe, everybody should be a bit patient and uh, see see how this relationship develops and, and what, you know, people um, end up achieving out of this. So uh, that's the first part. Thanks. Um, any other, uh, David, Derek, Yun? Okay. No, I would, I would, I would just say that um, you know it's it's more symbolic than anything else um, for both Taiwan and you know for the United States in terms of the Taipei Act, as I mentioned earlier. That I mean, there is an incentive to do more, to have more interactions, not less, with Taiwan. Uh, and so, you know, I I was glad to see that, and you know, it does send a message to China that. Um, you know, the countries that it thinks it may have under wraps in terms of diplomatic partners, well, maybe there could be a switch in the opposite direction. Not always Taiwan losing diplomatic partners to China, but maybe one day um, that, that China would lose a diplomatic partner or two. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'm, I, I've been following this news, but it seems that Guyana has not really extended diplomatic recognition to Taiwan by establishing this this office, right? So I think symbolically, I agree with uh, with 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 my co-panelists that this is a direction that that should be encouraged because Taiwan should expand its international space and its outreach to the international community. But I think there's still a difference between what Taiwan can do in the name of Taiwan office or Taiwan representative office and um, not to equate that with diplomatic recognition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question is from uh, Mia Tanaka um, at Kyoto News. And this isn't addressed to any uh, particular panelist. So again, anyone can take this, but I think Vincent, you might be probably the one that would uh, be best suited to answer this. Question is, do you think it is realistic to see Taiwan joining the CPTPP? What would be the main obstacles? And do you think there is enough political momentum inside the US and Japan to support Taiwan's move to join the CPTPP? Um, I think I'll, I'll proceed from the second part back to the first part, which is I, you know, I think it's uh, it's interesting to to raise this topic here in the United States, both for obvious reasons and some not so obvious reason. Uh, an obvious reason is because the U.S. is not a member of CPTPP and, and in fact backed out of CPTPP. So, it, in respect to I think the role that the U.S. can play, I think that this is still very much a topic of discussion, and it's not something I'm I have an answer on. Uh, but um, but that doesn't change Taiwan's overall objective of joining CPTPP. In fact, it's 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 really a matter of priority for Taiwan because we've seen RCEP, now we see CPTPP, and gradually what we're seeing is economic integration at a regional level. And Taiwan, as a part of that region, uh, cannot and should not be le left out. So I, I think certainly you know the intention is there, although. And, and as my colleagues in Taipei have admitted, there are also challenges. And the challenges is that CPTPP is very much a consensus-driven organization. So there has to be a broad consensus about Taiwan's participation there. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think it's still very much a work in progress. Certainly, the issue of the UK uh, raising its application, uh, I think, has spurred a discussion about new membership. And I'm sure that Taiwan wants to be part of that discussion. 
Um, it's just that uh, there's still, I think, challenges we need to overcome in this process. Great. And I should just add, just in fairness to the questioner, that, that you did have a follow on um, a question that does address the fact that, you know, uh, Biden administration seems to be holding off on bilateral or multilateral trade agreements. Um, is this a stance that's, a dis uh, that's disappointing for Taiwan that is hoping for a, U a trade agreement with the U.S.? And perhaps you and you might be able to address this and others. Um, the, what would be the possible repercussions from China if the U.S. moves ahead with a trade agreement with Taiwan? Um, well, well to, to that question, Russell, I'm, I think we, you know, we, we haven't seen a whole lot in terms of, uh, of, uh, of trade policy at this point. I mean, certainly we're only a few days into this new administration that the new USTR has not been confirmed yet. So it's not to say that we won't, but it's just that I think there's still a lot of uh, questions and, 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 and discussion over it right now. Um, you know, um, hopefully there is there, there will be a sense that, you know, multilateral trade is different than bilateral trade and that some uh, sensitivities uh, in respect to multilateral trade won't apply the same way to bilateral trade. And that opens up other opportunities for Taiwan in terms of bilateral trade. So so again, I think it's still a question at this point. But uh, the way we see it would be certainly that that, you know, entry into organizations like CPTPP will be a whole nother discussion than a bilateral trade agreement between Taiwan and the U.S. Yeah, and you want to take the uh, what you think um, would be Beijing's reaction if the United States were to, you know, pursue a, a trade agreement with Taiwan? Thank you, Russell. That is a great question. And that's a question that we are all intrigued about, right? And um, in my preliminary research, and I'm, I'm, I will come any correction from, uh, from my co-panelists, that I think the assessment in China about the, the likelihood of this trade agreement between U.S. and Taiwan to be achieved in the foreseeable future, or in the near future, is fairly low. So in their assessment, there are, there are like Vincent just mentioned, that there are procedural issues. There are also a lot of substantive issues. So I don't get the sense that in mainland China, they see this is happening tomorrow. Okay. All right. Uh, we have a question from Joe Bosco, who is a GTI advisor. This is for Yun. Um, the question here is, can the U.S. influence the internal China debate on the use of force against Taiwan? Would strategic clarity on America's intention to defend Taiwan strengthen the hand of the so-called moderates? Yun? Ah, that's a great question. So I think to begin with, I will still reiterate that I don't think the Chinese are prioritizing the use of force. I don't think that the use of force is still regarded as um, as their as their preferred strategy coming to unification. Because if the Chinese believe that time is on their side, the power balance between U.S. and China is tilting in China's favor, and it's more so in relative terms because of the COVID. So for the for the Chinese, what they are trying to do is really to make sure that Taiwan independence doesn't happen before that day comes. So I would reiterate that I don't think unification by force is a prioritized strategy or agenda on China's policy lexicon. But now to prioritize use of force doesn't mean that the Chinese can prepare, can cannot prepare for the use of force. So they will always prepare for the use of force and also use coercion to force Taiwan into the direction that mainland China wants to see. But I don't think that they will take the decision very lightly. Because in the two scenarios that I, that I mentioned, yes, China has higher level of strategic resolve, but is the result really in China's favor? So there is a total war or a World War III between US and China over Taiwan. I think Taiwan will be the first to suffer. And what's going to happen to China? Is China Ch Chinese Communist Party still able to maintain their 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 legitimacy and their power? So I think, given all those factors and taking into consideration the political costs and the, and the benefits that they can reap, they are really preparing the use of force as the last resort, and it's not a prioritized strategy. Thank you. Thanks, um, Derek and David. Do you want to jump in on on whether or not you know how can the United States influence the debate within China with regards to? The use of force against Taiwan. I know we often talk about deterrence, but beyond simply deterrence, are there other means in which you know you think the U.S. policymakers should consider, or you know, in assessing how to affect the debate in China with regards to the use of force against Taiwan? Any? No. Well, I, 
Uh, we had an interesting conversation a couple months back with a Chinese scholar who actually said, you know, as a Chinese person, I support strategic clarity because the variable that we don't know about is what the U.S. reaction would be, and we would rather have that baked into the cake. Essentially, mm -hmm. tell us what you're going to do, and then we can prepare and respond accordingly. But the fact that we don't know what you're going to do is uh, complicating kind of our calculus and how we approach this issue. So that's just one perspective, but I just don't think it's monolithic um, in China, as I'm sure Yun would support. There are these d vigorous debates in the elite Chinese policymaking and scholarly community. Um, in terms of what we can do, of course, you know, there is a public declaration of clarity, but we also can signal to China privately um as a first step what we would what we would do and how we would view this before going public with uh with a more um clarified stance so that's so that's one option that that we could that we could do i mean i'm sure everybody here has read the longer telegram by an anonymous uh person that was posted last week and they called explicitly for sharing with china our red lines right and one of the red lines that this person argued uh, that we should communicate is Taiwan. So if you do it publicly, privately, that's a question that we could have internally, but certainly that's something that we can uh, that we can think about. Right. Well, you know, we have other questions from the audience and I wish I could really get to, um, you know, I could get to all of them. Um, but, you know, fortunately we have uh, exhausted the time um, for uh, today's discussion. So I really want to thank our our, um, our panelists, David, Yun, Vincent, and and Derek, um, and um, again to all our audience members uh, for participating in today's call. Uh, thank you all, and uh, you know, stay safe and uh, stay healthy. Take care. Thank you, Russell. Bye. Bye.